to tell you a story about a, about a friend of mine. I got a friend lives over. I live in Weatherford. Got a friend lives over in Parker County. Owns a farm. And um, uh, we got money for a long time. Went over to see him not too long ago. And uh, he was showing me around the farm. And uh, the crops and animals. First one thing and another. And we're walking down through, through the pasture. And I said, that could be. I come across this three-legged pig. And I asked him, I said, what's with the three-legged pig? And he, and he got a little indignant. He said, don't, don't, don't start with the pig. That's a special animal there. I, uh, and I, I won't have anything bad said about this pig. And I, well, I'm not going to say anything bad about the pig. I just want to know, why does he have three legs? And he was, my friend was kind of a little more indignant about it. And he said, he said that, that animal saved my life last year. And a tractor fell over out in the pasture, and I was trapped. Steering wheel pressed against my chest. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get out from the tractor. Pig comes over, sees me, jumps into the, in, under the tractor, digs in, grabs me by the collar, and pulls me to safety. So don't start with the, with the pig. That's special pig. Okay, fine. I'm not going to say anything, you know, ugly about your pig. I just want to know why the three legs. And he was like, about six months ago, middle of the night, our house catches on fire. He said, the house is blazing, blazing. We're all in substairs asleep. The pig sees this. The speed comes over, body slams the door, comes in, wakes everybody up, grabs their three-year-old daughter by the back of her pajamas and pulled her to safety. So don't give me any trouble about my pig or what he looks like. I just want to know why this wonderful pig has only three legs. And my friend looked at him and said, seriously, Seriously, you don't understand. I said, no, seriously. A great pig like that? You don't eat them all at once. <laughs> which, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I, I just always wanted to tell that joke in public. <laughs> all right, let's, let's hope that my, my talk on cartooning will be that entertaining. Um, cartooning. I'm, cartooning's been around forever. Um, I'll start with a little John Knott quote. That ought to be a good place to start with this one. We'll kind of, we'll kind of wrap this, you know, kind of wrap it all up in one little sentence. He wrote, um, as he said himself, every child at some period of life has the imitative extinct instinct to want to draw. Some of them grow out of it. Others become normal people. Others become artists. That's sort of the way a lot of cartoons look at. We, we wish that we could do something else besides this, but this is our gift, and so we go with it. There's never, there's not any money in it. There's not any, uh, not much in the way of paths on the back of rewards. People are not all that impressed with what you do, but it's what we do. And John Knott was a genius at this. Uh, cartooning's been around forever. I suspect the first cartoonist was some Neanderthal guy squatting in the mud somewhere and he drew a smiley face looking thing in the mud and, and pointed to his cave buddy and said, oh, you, ha, 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 ha. That was probably the first cartoonist and it went downhill from there. Since then, you'll find cartoons everywhere. You find them on cave walls, uh, 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 ancient temples, uh, Gothic cathedrals, public bathrooms everywhere. Uh, everyone seems, when I was trying to get my, my, my own comic strip, Blue Bonnet Syndicated, years ago, a uh, fellow told me, he says, we always require that a cartoonist submit 50 drawings. He said, because everybody on the planet has 25 cartoons in them. <laughs> and I've learned that to be true. Everybody thinks, you know, a lot, I know how many people who, who, who think this is something that, I, I can do that. But anyway, um, cartooning as we know it, uh, in print media, probably came along, came in, into being about the same time, about the time Gutenberg stole the idea of the printing press from the Chinese, and we started printing things in mass and making newsletters. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you ever read the Wall Street Journal, it's these long gray columns. It's very old to just sit and read, unless you're terribly interested in, in what the, the Wall Street Journal is saying. It's not, they're not very pretty to look at. So some genius editor got the bright idea several hundred years ago to uh, let's break up the space a little with some artwork. And uh, let's see if I can get this keyed up here. 
I found this. I was reading an article about uh, uh, crop circles and how this the in England and how they that phenomenon the farmers finding things in their their fields had gone on for several hundred years. And I came across this drawing. This is from 1678, the Hertfordshire News. And this is very, newspapers were very new at this time. They were just getting started. But already the, they had the great idea that people, they want to read a story. They also like something visual about it. So the, car, the, the cartoon or the line illustration was born probably 100 years before this. And it began to develop as newspapers and various publications changed and grew, uh, became, uh, instead of just one big sheet of like a newsletter to multiple pages, uh, they find a great way to advertise, a great way to, uh, like I said, break up the column. And since most people were illiterate, and they like, like some politician once said, half of my, my constituents can't even read, but I can't stop them looking at those damn pictures. So... So, with, so with, within 100 years, uh, the, uh, the comic strip, as along with the newspaper, began to become more and more sophisticated, where the first ones were basically just, you know, the artist would draw a picture on a piece of, piece of wood and then whittle out everything except the drawing. By this time, they were doing steel engravings. They became much more sophisticated. And I guess because no one takes cartoons serious, or seriously, and my wife probably correct me, since they don't take them, you know, as, as an honest bit of artwork, you can get away with things, cartoon. You know, you're depicting, depicting uh, King George and the, and the Prince of Wales and the Queen, you know, as fat, ugly slobs and pigs. You could do that. Now, if you, wrote this, if you wrote that same article, you'd probably get your head cut off. But it's just a cartoon, so who cares? It's not, not anything anybody's going to pay attention to. Moving into the to uh, uh, to our uh, into the twentieth century or to the nineteenth century, um, every newspaper there were hundreds of newspapers, mostly out of New York and Chicago and Philadelphia, and they all had and they all had were beginning to, to really develop these very stylized, very detailed comics, um, light illustrations, uh, still with the still same still engraving. I just kind of like to I just pick this one because it's a nice picture of, you know, not everyone thought Abraham Lincoln was the, the end all and, and beginning and end all of, uh, of history. They hated him back in the day, too. Well, let me, I'm going to go there first and come back. Um, People begin to cut the, the editorial page. We went from sort of the cartoon, here's a funny picture of Lincoln, uh, to trying to more and more serious illustrations. And they begin to, uh, the, the, the beginning of the uh, editorial cartoon, where the cartoonist just didn't draw a picture. His, his job was to, act like, like a, one of the newspaper editors, his job was to uh, deliver a story or deliver a, a, a message. I've got this one out particularly because this was, we, you know, we hear a lot these days about fake news. We think, oh, that's something new. I remember when I was a boy, all the news was fair and honest. Well, in the 1890s, it was called yellow dog journalism. Uh, basically the same thing we're doing now. Uh, William Randolph Hearst wanted, and Teddy Roosevelt and others wanted to drive the Spanish out of the Western Hemisphere. And we found a little rumor somewhere that Spanish officers were, were searching American ladies. Well, no, they were, yes and no, they were going through their luggage. But uh, Hearst told his artist, he said, you give me the pictures and I'll give you the war. So they went from uh, ladies having their handbags looked into to you know, fragile young, you know, young girls being strip searched by leering Spanish officers. Wasn't true, but like I said, I can't stop people from looking at those damn pictures. Uh, so by the so by the 1890s, this is kind of where we've come up, where cartoons can come to. I'm going to back up just a couple here. 1892, uh, there was a cartoonist, Frank. Altcut or something like that was his name. 
I'm terrible with names, did a comic strip for the the New York Journal called it. When it wasn't a comic strip, it was a weekly political cartoon. And it was called uh, <clears throat> Hogan's Alley. And Hogan's Alley was always, always sort of the same thing. It'd be a street scene in New York, uh, you know, a ghetto part of town, or there were slums in those days, uh, or tenement areas. And they're all this, this, the cartoons, they're always full of people in their various stereotypes. If you're Irish, you were drunk. If you were Jewish, you had a big nose and you were a crook. If you were Chinese, you ran a laundry. All the stereotypes were always there. And in Hogan's Alley, there'd be a little balloon over all these characters, and in their own little brogue or accent, they would make some comment about something that happened earlier in the, earlier in the, uh, the week. For some reason, he drew this one. He came up with one little character. So he's always just sort of in the sideline, the background. This little guy. Uh, because he always wore this yellow slicker, he, he became known as the Yellow Kid. He is the first recognizable published cartoon character uh, from about 1892 until about 1900. Well, he, he still shows up occasionally if you, if you read enough cartoons. He's... Uh, I don't, he's, he's sort of like a prehistoric version of Alfred E. Newman to me. Right? <laughs> uh, but uh, same difference. Uh, he, he, when he did speak, his accent was so thick you could hardly understand him. So most of his little comments were written on, across the front of his, uh, his uh, little yellow raincoat or whatever. Whatever that is. Anyway, Yellow Kid was, uh, was the very first... Uh, recognizable national cartoon that people from New York to Los Angeles or Dallas could point to, and they knew who he was, and they actually looked forward to him. Eventually, uh, Yellow Kid kind of took over Hogan's Alley, and, this, and the, whole, uh, the whole comic was about him. About the same time, just a little bit later, this cute little fellow shows up. This is Little Nemo. Nemo is Latin for um, uh, no one. Uh, the, there was a, this was the first comic strip. Came out weekly. Uh, there was a serial. It's always the same thing. Nemo, who is, in his case, he's a, kind of a middle class, upper middle class kid. Always tries to say, he liked to read in bed. And he would, whatever he's reading, Huckleberry Finn or King Arthur or whatever, he would go to sleep. And this odd little clown would show up with a, you know, with a top hat and a, green face and a cigar and he would take Nemo to slumberland where they would have an adventure and Nemo he's the first the little Nemo in slumberland was the first nationally recognized what we would call today a comic strip I'm just giving a little background history and cartooning see where all we're coming from here uh, he's, he's also still around occasionally and uh, like in 1989 they made a feature link film about about this kid about this kid and then there are books. All the all this also the, the cartoons were really later published into into books. If you get a chance, go to half price books and get these. These are great, especially if you've got kids. All right, now that brings me up to what we all came here to hear about. Mr. John Knott. John Knott was born what was hunger uh, Austria Austria at the time. Uh now at the um it's now is um um the Czech Republic. And uh, when he was about five years old, his, he and his widow, widowed mother moved to Sioux City, Iowa, uh, where they lived, where he went, when he went to school, he grew up. And about age 16, he developed this illness, this mental disorder, this illness that, that just made him decide that he wanted to become a cartoonist. <laughs> and although his mother, his poor, his poor widowed mother, tried hard to, to dissuade him from doing that, uh, the illness set in, and he decided he was going to go off to Chicago and try to make and try to work as a cartoonist. Like most cartoonists, it didn't really go over all that well. He landed jobs. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll try not to do that in my, into the microphone. He landed jobs doing uh, the occasional drawing that he might might or might not get paid for. It all sounds very familiar. I uh, sort of languished at this for a while. He did eventually uh, 
did doing a little regular work with a couple of different uh, Chicago papers, but not enough to sustain himself. So in early, the early 19th century, he packed the whole family up, sold everything he had, and moved to Germany for two years, where he studied art. Uh, came back, and his talents greatly improved, and uh, his being a little older, his knowledge of the world, his knowledge of uh, of um, uh, just politics and how how things work were a lot more mature. He began to work uh, once again for the Chicago papers. Like the guy got paid to do some of his work. But he had, a, he had a little bit of a family to take care of now, not making a lot of money. He accepted a job with a print company who, out of Chicago, he was actually, he was actually doing magazines and things, <clears throat> sold in the, in the Dallas area, where he drew uh, harnesses and saddles and leather gear for mail-order catalogs. And occasionally did a little bit of artwork. When, um, uh, about, I guess it was like 1911, he was, he, was, he was offered a contract to become be the, the assistant cartoonist for the Dallas Morning News. He um, um, got there just about the time for, for, for President Wilson's, uh, uh, you know, campaign and, and inaugural and jumped right into it there. Uh, from, from then until he retired in 1957, he was, he and the Dallas Morning News were sort of in the forefront of all the social issues of the day. You know, World War I, uh, women's suffrage, uh, the Depression, uh, the rise and fall of Nazi Germany, World War II, uh, sidelines about trying to develop Fair Park, trying to develop uh, Love Field, trying to develop uh, uh, traffic con- ordinances for Dallas. Big thing they did, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, was um, from about 1910 until about 1920, 22, Dallas was controlled entirely by the Ku Klux Klan. If you were the mayor or the dog catcher or you owned a bank or you owned a small business or did anything, you were a member of the Klan. That's just the way it was. Uh, G.B. Dealey, the uh, president of the, of the Dallas Morning News, and John Knott took it on them telling themselves to take on the Klan. Uh, very dangerous thing to do in those days. Um, I'm just going to kind of roll through some of these uh, these cartoons, and we'll talk about them a little as we get to them. We've kind of arranged them in order from the earliest uh, to the later ones. Some of them are, uh, uh, are nice, serious, tight illustrations. Some are funny cartoons. And uh, you will occasionally see the, uh, the odd uh, um, stereotype, you know, Mexicans with big sombreros and, and uh, uh, white pajamas. You'll see it. that was stock and trade for cartoonists until about 1960. Everybody had a, had a stereotype. If you were a Texan, you, had a, you were rich and you wore cowboy hats everywhere. If you were... Uh, you know, if you were uh, Chinese, you had the, you wore the you know you wore the the hat and you had the queue and it, so you will see a lot of that sort of thing through here. Um, these are great old cartoons. Let's just kind of kind of go through and I'll talk a little about it, about the ones. Some I'm just going to go through and let you enjoy. Let's see what we got here. This is kind of an early cartoon of himself. John Knott wasn't. He, he was an odd character. He was a genius. Um, he kept his own hours. He came and he, he would come and go as he as he saw, as he saw fit. He um, would go on vacation without telling anybody that he was going or when he was going to come back. Um, he um, you did a, he did a cartoon a day every day, and when he was finished. He would leave. He would attend the editorial meetings. Never really commented much about him. He took no one's suggestions. Whatever they suggested, he would ignore. He would ignore and go do his artwork and then disappear. And unless you knew John Knott, you wouldn't know where he had gone to. Which usually, as soon as he could get out of the building, he would go 
uh, down to a local bar out in the belt, out from the building, and played dr- played dominoes and drank beer all all evening. So if you need him, you better catch him soon. <laughs> Let's see if we're doing it. It's sort of a comment on fashion editors. I like to read these things. Uh, uh, the good thing about a really good editorial cartoonist is that regardless of the, the time they're in or this, or I think you can kind of go through them, you recognize the characters, Uncle Sam, you know, uh, you know lynching is evil, you understand these kind of things. This is the, the early ones when they were really starting to take on the Klan. And of course, Dallas traffic. You think it's something new, don't you? And that's what I like to say. Everything, everything old is new again. <clears throat> We're getting into the 1930s. We're getting into Jewish suppression all over Europe. It was a big deal. G.B. Daly, uh, Mr. Daly, and John, and all these these. We're very concerned about it. You, you, you know, then as now, you try to direct public opinion. You know, you're living in Dallas in the 1920s. You know, European Jews, that's 10,000 miles away. What does that have to do with me? Well, this is what it has to do with you. The depression, you know, the the, the depression of third, of this, well, after war, after World War One, Germany was pretty well gutted by the rest of the world. They went in and stripped, they stripped everything out of Germany, left it pretty well poverty, pretty much poverty stricken. And John and John, who had lived in Germany for a couple of years, understood these things. Uh oh, we're getting into World War One now. Great artwork, pencil. If you can imagine, these he did one of these a day. This was this was a day's worth of work. One of those, and usually two to four hours. But that was three hundred and sixty-five a year. If you don't know anything about history, you don't understand the. The Germans really weren't that bad of people, but you got to turn them into monsters if you want to start a war with them. He was uh, the, one of his, during, during World War I, one of his most common illustrations, one of the most common subjects was the war bond and try to buy, you know, buy bonds, you know, help, uh, help support the war effort. And so he did several of these things. Talking about the Germans oppressing Europe, I like the way he always he like he he portrayed the countries as women. And if you I don't know if you can tell the uh, the map on on the right, that is the the shaded area the shaded area shows occupied grounds. Those are all dead bodies. Getting a little post-war here, wondering what the uh, the Kaiser's going to wonder what, what he's going to do in a republic. The one on the right. Just a little play, the old man, the young woman, you know. She's, look, she's the future, he's the past. Ask the ladies out here a uh, trivia question. When did women get the right to vote? When did women get the right to vote? No. No. Women got the right to vote when the Constitution was signed in the 1780s. The voting was a state's right. And it was from state to state to state to say who could vote. Early, early days of the country, any person that owned a property could vote. If you were male, female, black, white, whatever, if you owned property, you could vote. 
early 1800s, the Federalists come along. That's the slash Federalists slash Democrats. And they thought that was unfair. Every man should have the right to vote whether he owns property or not. So they put that through the Constitution. It's not the state's right, it's a national right. However, the way they wrote it was every man has a right to vote, but not the women. So in the early 1800s, ladies lost the right to vote in most states. So, but it wasn't until 1920 when uh, that was repealed and we brought in the right for women to vote. And Dallas Morning News was a big advocate of, of, of women's rights in those days. And uh, this, is one of, this is one of John Knight's offerings. Of course, you notice how things just change back and forth now. Now it's the, uh, the evil Republicans as opposed to the, uh, the evil Democrats. We, but, but the sentiment's the same. Think about the uh, editorial cartoonists like him. He wasn't, I was a cartoonist for the morning news. Someone comes to me and says, Ed, I need a picture of a running horse and this uh, drawing. I did that. The, the, an editorial cartoonist, what he wants to put on the paper is what goes in the paper. So they would go to, he sit in on an edit, at the editorial meetings in the morning and whatever they talked about, he would develop his own opinion of what he wanted to do. And that was, and this, so this is not some editor telling him what to do. These are his ideas. I'm just going to play through some of these. They're pretty self-explanatory. And I like to look at the artwork as, instead of just listening to me natter on about these things. Yeah, that was, up until that was the, World War I era, 1920s. <laughs> yes. Wayward Tennessee. <laughs> now, the old fellow on the right, one with Texas on his hat. You will see him more and more as time goes on. <clears throat> uh, not wanted a, <clears throat> excuse me, not wanted a, um, he wanted a character, someone he could drop in who would make um, comments of the day, someone who was like, who, tip of, who was typical Texas. Well, there was a fellow, let's see if I can can't remember his name all of a sudden. No, Jimmy Boyd of Lancaster. I have no idea who Jimmy Boyd was, but in early 1920s, excuse me, um, he came, Mr. Boyd wanders into the editorial department looking for someone. John Knott saw him and immediately he just loved his look and immediately sketched uh, Mr. Boyd's character. Mr. Boyd later became Old Man Texas. Um, Old Man Texas is sort of the voice of reason. He commented on... The, he was sensible. He was uh, practical. Uh, something going on in the state. Old man Texas would be, would be there with, with a comment, and he stayed with uh, he stayed with John Knight's cartoons up to the very end. Oh, never he never changed. Always the same, same hat and coat and funny looking mustache. <clears throat> Getting more into the women's suffrage. In the 1920s, ladies had come a long way. <laughs> well, we're sort of getting, <clears throat> getting into the area of the Klan. <clears throat> I'm sorry about the, the coughing, but I just, I'm allergic to air. <laughs> There's old man Texas again. No, but seriously, the Klan was just, uh, I mean, they, they literally ran the city of Dallas.
my good friend Alan back there, he's a he's an archaeologist. I guess that one's for him. But I've never seen him wear a top hat though. Now, what's a big subject today? Well, what's a what's a nation without borders? Are you here legally? Well, like I said, there's nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> Now these are, now we're having the displays going on upstairs, so when you get through here, take your time and go up, as I kind of rip through this thing, go upstairs, look at the, uh, um, you know, and, look, and actually see the exhibit up close personally. It's, 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 it's great to see his actual, you know, the actual pen on paper. Okay, <clears throat> 1930s, the Depression. Unemployed college graduate. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And once again, I'd like to point out, remember, this is, this is a day's worth of artwork. And as long as there has been a Dallas, and as long as there's been Dallas uh, public officials, they have been trying to turn the Trinity River into something navigable. It didn't work in the 1890s. It didn't work in the 1930s, and it didn't work two years ago. It is, it's not a river, folks. It's a creek. So leave it alone. That was a big, uh, that was a, also a big uh, 1930s thing. One reason LB, that Lyndon Johnson became as popular as he did was uh, back in the 30s, the electrical companies were stringing wire all over Texas. And there were a lot of farmers just all over the state that would have electrical poles out in their pastures, but no wires running to their house. And so Lyndon Johnson and others started this movement, if you're going to put up, if you're going to, if you can, if you're going to put an electrical pole on somebody's property, you at least give him electricity to his house. Now, well, we know where that place is. I don't know, I've, 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 it wouldn't hurt my feelings at all if, if, if we replaced big techs with old man Texas. It kind of makes more sense anyway, isn't it? You know, so you know, this this he 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 features women in, in so much of this kind of stuff. You know, we we uh, maybe it's because he was a father of daughters. Big promoter of Texas, of course. Well, we're starting to see a little fascism show up. The one on the, the one on the, the left with the the one on the left with the sharks. Um, I don't know. I just I'll I'll, I'll complain for a minute. Um, contemporary artist about the same time was a was a painter named uh, Edward Hopper. He's one of my favorite artists. I just love Edward Hopper's work. Edward Hopper might do five, six paintings a year, and they hang in museums, and all the art snobs will stand around and know oh, how meaningful, how, how morose, oh, isn't this business is wonderful? And they'd give, you know, give him a million dollars, and he'd go do his next painting. A cartoonist, well, John Knott, for example, do 365 things a year, puts them in the paper, you look at him 30, for 30 seconds, I don't get it, wad it up and throw it away. And he's pretty, he does well if he can make a pretty good living at it. Cartoonist, like Michonat, is every bit the artist that a painter or a sculptor would be. They're, I just sometimes feel like uh, they're just not as 
appreciated as they should be. Maybe because everybody thinks they can do it. That's just me complaining. 19, well, in the 1930s, the Nazis had started rounding up the Jews. And there were 20,000 Jewish children destined for labor camps. And some charitable organization decided, we can rescue these children. America, will you take them? 20,000. John Knott, who had been in Germany, who was of Germanic ancestry, he knew what this was all about. He knew why, how this was going to play out. The men of morning news <clears throat> fought very hard to rescue these children. They didn't. All 20,000 of them probably ended up in a death camp somewhere. Nineteen forties, <clears throat> World War Two, big growth, Texas, oil, cotton. Texas was kind of the boom state. I guess it still is. <clears throat> trying, trying to get the park cities to merge with, uh, <coughs> merge with Dallas, didn't work then. I like the, the way that I like the way he's depicted these children uh, from the from Park City School, and one with the kilt, especially. <laughs> and trying to put a, a, an airport in that straddles the county line. They eventually did that. It's just a different county line. So, like I said, a lot of these are just self-explanatory. I put these in the color and they're funny. <laughs> Especially the one on the right. I just love this. And these are not quite so funny. Oh, well, we're, we're sort of at the end of it. This last few are mine. Uh, before we get into my stuff, does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts? All right. I do a comic. I do a comic strip called Blue Bonnie. This is a plug. I said part of. It. I said, oh, y'all, yeah, I'll come talk, John. I'll let me plug myself a little bit too. And they, they were, they were gracious enough to say sure. Um, I do a, an online comic strip called Blue Bonnets. Uh, you'll, you'll find it, probably the easiest way to find it is just simply Google Blue Bonnets Ed Owens, and it'll come up. It's on a uh, Universal Press Syndicate's uh, cartoon website called Go Comics under a section called Sherpa, if you want to go through all that. Or like I said, just Google Blue Bonnets Ed Owens, and it'll do it. And I, when I started doing this, well, I'm going to throw in a few of my, tar my cartoons, plug my comic strip, and that was going to be the end of it. And then it's something dawned on me about a week ago. These are the principal characters in my comic strip. It's the Sorrel family. They live in the little town of Weathersboro, Texas. The old guy in the middle is Pop Sorrel. He's uh, sort of the patriarch of the family. He's also sort of the usually the voice of reason in the comic strip. And the more I got looking at it, I think subliminally, He's my old man, Texas. And I didn't know I had done that until I started working on this little project here. He also likes to tell old jokes. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I kind of just, I kind of, this was sort of out of context. If you don't know, there, there's a the family has a kind of a strange aunt, Aunt Blythe. She's sort of a spooky, gruesome, tall, skinny, scary little old lady. And I, I put her in there in the strip because virtually every family has one. And, um, but I did this because I decided I also showed my, my pencil drawing where you go from your know, pencil sketch to a finished uh, Photoshop illustration. The thing I was talking about, there, you know, anymore there's no such thing as original art anymore. Uh, if you do, used to, 
Well, John Knotts, you go upstairs, you see his original artwork. Nowadays, it would all be in a pencil sketch. The sketch would go into Photoshop. The Photoshop would be in, done in several different layers, several different versions, and the one you like the best is the one you would print. So that's where we are these days. And that's it. And then I, I believe that's my presentation, such as it was. Oop, let's see, let me go back to the thing. Well, there we go. Um, a little more about Mr. Knott before I go and all this. So he was a, like I said, he was a bit of a character. 1939, he won a mon an honorable mention in the, uh, with a, with a, uh, the Pulitzer Prize. His, his family didn't know that until years later, or sometime later, when they saw a photograph of Margaret Mitchell, who had won the, uh, uh, the award for best book, Gone with the Wind, and John Knott. He didn't uh, particularly care for, it didn't mean anything to him, uh, you know, accolades and trophies and awards. He um, also won the Headliners Award out of New York, at one point, and uh, he was invited to New York to receive his award as the best editorial cartoonist of that year, all this sort of business, come do this. He refused to go. So the, uh, um, the presenter of the, of, the, the, of the award said, well, well, we'll come to Dallas and bring the award to him. Okay, fine, so they show up, and they find Mr. D. Lynn said, well, we're going to give the award to, uh, to Mr. Knott for, you know, his best cartoon of the year. Where is he? They took him to his office. He was, his office was closed and locked. He wasn't there. <laughs> so they asked a, uh, one of the local uh, uh, newsboys there, where's Mr. Knott? And says, the kid, the kid knew where he was. Says, I know where he is. I'll go get him. He's at the beer joint playing dominoes. So this is back when the Dallas Morning News used to be over where, kind of where El Centro is now. So the kid runs down and runs up to the beer joint, tells he's gone for a few minutes, comes back, and uh, without, without Mr. Knott, and he says, where is, where is Mr. Knott? And says, says hey, he doesn't want the award, he doesn't want to come. So they took his award and hung it on the doorknob of his, uh, of his office. Uh, he was a character, he was a genius. Um, his work is upstairs, you really need to go spend some time looking at it, try to pre, try to, uh, understand his times and his look. And I think I have prattled on about all I can about that. Um, well, a, little, a little audience participation now, if you don't mind. I want you to use your imagination. You don't have to jump up to do anything. I just want you to use your imagination. <clears throat> I want you to imagine uh, a jungle. A very dark, nasty, steamy, hot evil jungle. It's in south, it's central West Africa. It straddles the, it straddles the uh, uh, equator. They're, they're this, this place has never uh, known a cool temperature. Now, on this particular day, I want you, you to imagine. Uh, it is hotter than usual. It's like there's no even a hint of the breeze. The air is thick. It's nasty. The dreaded gaboon vipers are just hanging from the trees like limp green spaghetti. It's miserable. In the middle of this jungle, there is a swamp. And not so much a swamp as it is a puddle of thick green ooze. And in the middle of this thick green ooze are two hippopotami. And they're submerged in the goo with nothing but their nostrils and their eyes and their ears sticking above. And they've been standing there, sitting there all day long. I haven't moved in hours. After a while, one of the hippos slowly, painfully, slowly turns to his companion and says, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like Thursday to me. Anyway, that's, that's, that's another joke I've always wanted to tell the public. 
And that includes my natterings, so I hope you've got a little something out of it. I do hope that you will go upstairs and enjoy the John Ott exhibit. Thank you.